Okay, uh, great. Do you, do you hear me? It's good, right? All right, awesome. Uh, so yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, a phenomenal workshop. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about random circuits, and particularly the theory of random circuits. Um, so okay, uh, the starting point for the talk, which I think you know, will come as no surprise to anyone here, is that the first quantum advantage claims have, have now been made. Right? And we've seen this, of course, several times, first by Google in late 2019, uh, you know, in superconducting qubits, and, and more recently by uh, USTC and by Xanadu, who implemented uh, you know, the so-called Gaussian boson sampling proposal for quantum advantage in linear optics, uh, you know, several times now. Um, you know, and so in this talk, I, I want to sort of talk about the latest sort of rigorous complexity theoretic arguments to understand these so-called random circuit exper experiments. And actually, you know, both of these uh, sort of classes of experiments are really just sort of different types of random circuit experiments. They um, have a lot of similarities, even though their architectures are very different experimentally. Okay, but before we get into that, so I think it's, it's worth sort of pinpointing what is the ideal goal? You know, what are we trying to achieve here? Because it's sort of surprising uh, how little agreement there is, even in, uh, I think, among experts. So let me tell you what I feel. Uh, okay, we want to find a problem that one can be solved using a near-term uh, quantum experiment. So, you know, we, we don't want to use fault tolerance or something that's, you know, um, somewhat futuristic. Uh, we, we want it to be classically hard to solve. And you know, I think here it's really important that we hold ourselves to a really high standard. Right? We're, 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 we're not interested merely in, in saying you know, the best uh, available tensor network algorithm you know, run on uh, you know, the, the, the best Google classical supercomputer you know, doesn't work in a reasonable amount of human time. We really want to say that you know, no matter what classical algorithm we use, uh, you know, we won't be able to, uh, no matter what efficient classical algorithm uh, we use, we won't be able to solve this problem. Right? So that, that requires complexity theory. It's not, it's not optional. That's, that's how we talk about uh, algorithmic lower bounds of this, of this form. Uh, you know, and, and, and then finally, I want the solution to be uh, you know, efficiently verifiable with a, with a classical computer with minimal trust in the experiment. Uh, so when we get the answer, I, I want to be able to, uh, to make sure that it's, it's the right answer. Uh, and this, this minimal trust in the experiment, this is, this is really important. Uh, it's not because we don't trust uh, our experimental friends. Uh, we, we, we do. Uh, the issue is that uh, <laughs> sometimes we do. Uh, the, uh, the the, the, the issue is more that we want to think of quantum advantage as a test of quantum mechanics in a certain, uh, certain sort of high complexity regime uh, you know, that we haven't seen before. Uh, and, and if we're going to do that, we have to be really careful about the sorts of assumptions we make uh, you know, about our experiment. You know, if we assume, for example, that noise works in a certain way, uh, you know, we're already making an assumption about quantum mechanics. Uh, and and you know, we, we want to be very careful that we're not sort of making too many assumptions about physics to then try to test physics. That, that makes no sense. It's, it gets circular. Um, OK, so what is the status quo? Well, I would argue that we're not there yet. I think we've made a lot of exciting progress, but, uh, but we're not there. Um, so current quantum uh, advantage experiments solve sampling problems uh, in which the goal is to sample from a complicated distribution uh, implicitly specified by a random quantum circuit. Now, we'll discuss the sort of state-of-the-art evidence uh, that we have, which is still evidence. It's not completely uh, you know, proven uh, that these problems cannot be solved classically in, in polynomial time. Uh, but, you know, and I want to point out that these, this, the, the hardness arguments, the theory, is still quite separated from, uh, from the experiments. And, and one of the major points here is that current experiments just are not scalable. Uh, whereas complexity theory is always talking about asymptotics, about scaling. Um, and, and so I would say there's sort of two major reasons for this. And, and one is that you know, the, the verification of these, of these procedures, the way that we're checking that the experiments are solving these <laughs> sampling problems, fundamentally inefficient. They don't scale uh, very well. And, and, and two, of course, is uncorrected noise, which causes the signal, let's say the fidelity, uh, to, to rapidly decay as the system size and depth increase. Okay? Um, and we'll, we'll talk about noise more later. Okay, and so the, these issues sort of force current quantum advantage candidates to find what I call 
Goldilocks parameter regimes. Uh, you know, if you know the story, that's great. If you don't, what I mean is that you know we're looking for sort of a just right size, a medium size. You know, neither too small because that's obviously classically simulable, or too big because then at some point you know our signal is going to get imperceptibly small. Uh, we can't verify it. And, and, and so on. But this is sort of not satisfying from a complexity point of view. Again, complexity theory talks about asymptotics and about scaling. So you know, it's a super interesting question to ask if this is sort of inevitable or not. And I, I would argue this is sort of still very open. Uh, you know, in other words, can for, for random circuits, can classical hardness in some parameter regime, you know, some depth and some, you know, in, in, in some setting of parameters, can it, can it survive the noise in an asymptotic sense, even if we ignore verification? And, and we'll, we'll come back to this uh, toward the end of the talk. This is, I think, wildly open question at the moment. OK, cool. So now what do we mean by random circuits? Uh, what is random circuit sampling? Um, all right, so we want to generate a, a quantum circuit, C, on n qubits on a 2D lattice uh, with d, which is the depth, uh, it's a parameter, d layers of har random nearest neighbor gates. So, you know, the, uh, the, the, each layer of the gates might look something like this. The circles are qubits. The edges are har random two qubit nearest neighbor gates. This might be the first layer. The second layer might look different. For example, you know, we might interact, we might choose for the gates to act on horizontal neighbors rather than vertical neighbors in this, in this grid. But the point is that we start in the all zero input state uh, and all of our qubits, uh, our n qubits, we apply a random quantum circuit, which is like square root n or d, different layers of these, uh, of these har, har random gates. And then we measure all n qubits in the computational basis. We think of that as sampling from a distribution that I'll call d sub c over n bit strings. That's the task, hard stop, that's, that's it. We're sampling. Uh, from, from the output distribution of a random circuit. Now, it's been now this has been now implemented a number of times, culminating in uh, you know, uh, an experiment that was, I think, published on the archive uh, maybe uh, within the last month, something like that. That's a n equal 70, d equal 24 uh, Google experiment. OK, but our question is, why should RCS be classically hard? You know, um, and, and the first goal here that we're going to work on for a little while is to, to prove the impossibility of an efficient classical sampler algorithm that essentially simulates an idealized, meaning noiseless, version of the quantum experiment. So what, what should that do? Well, we want to show there's no classical algorithm that does essentially what the, what the quantum algorithm should do, namely takes a random quantum circuit as input, the description. Uh, the gate entries and so on, and then outputs a sample from the output <laughs> distribution, uh, which we're calling d sub c. Okay, and we want to show that no such classical algorithm can solve this problem. But I want to be very, very clear about this. Here we're not modeling noise. Okay, we're going to get to noise. Uh, that's that's super interesting question. But it's already not at all obvious from a computer science point of view that there's a hard quantum signal in this problem at all. Right? It's not at all clear, when we started thinking about this several years ago, it was not at all clear to us why randomly chosen quantum circuits, why, why, why don't they output complete nonsense? Right? What, what's going on there? Okay, um, okay so how, how do we argue about this in, in the noiseless case? Well, at the first, the, 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 you know, to be honest, the, 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 the first thing to realize is that computer scientists are not very good at arguing about sampling problems. And we just don't have a way of directly arguing about it. So the first thing we do is apply a well-known reduction due to Stockmeyer, which says, you know, if our goal is to prove the hardness of sampling from the output distribution of a random circuit, it suffices to prove that estimating the output probability of most random quantum circuits is sharp p hard. If you know what that is, that's great. If you don't, it means very hard. Okay? Uh, so, so in other words, we want to prove the hardness of, of estimating this quantity that I'm calling the output probability. It's just you know, what you think it is, probability of seeing all zeros when you measure after you apply the circuit, with an additive error 2 to the minus n. n is the qubits, right? So this is 1 over the dimension of the Hilbert space, uh, with probability 2 thirds over the circuit. Right? So we want to argue about the hardness of giving a good additive estimate to the output probability of most quant random quantum circuits. Okay. Um, so we think of this, this Stockmeyer reduction as working in the context as a, of a proof by contradiction. Okay? In other words, here's what we say. We say, let's suppose for contradiction there was a classical algorithm that simulated this experiment, a classical sampling algorithm. Well then, 
by the reduction, the Stockmeyer reduction, there would be another algorithm. And what it does is it gives this particular additive estimate to the output probabilities of most random quantum circuits. Now, we're trying to show that this bubble here is, is too good to be true. It's a hard problem. So we shouldn't have such an algorithm. And therefore, by the reduction, that we can't have a classical sampling algorithm. That's how the proof works. But our goal now is to show this, this statement that I have with an IE here. Right? That's not at all obvious. Uh, and that's going to be our starting point. In other words, to show that estimating the output probability of most random quantum circuits to some precision, two to the minus n, is a hard problem. Okay? And here, our inspiration actually comes from a very early work in complexity theory, well, very early, 91, uh, for me very early, uh, due to Dick Lipton. And it's a very beautiful proof, uh, which is the average case hardness of computing the permanent. Um, right, the starting point is, is a really famous result in complexity theory, which is that the permanent of uh, a worst case matrix is a hard problem. It's a sharp P hard problem. That means that we can't expect an algorithm to compute the, an efficient um, algorithm to uh, compute the permanent on any matrix. Okay? Um, this is what we mean by worst case. And this is a very surprising result, especially in the early 90s when it was first discovered, because permanent looks a lot like the determinant, which of course is easy. Uh, but the permanent is very hard. Now, Dick Lipton comes around and he wants to argue for something stronger. He wants to boost this from worst case hardness, which is the hardness of computing the permanent of any matrix, any arbitrary matrix, to something much stronger, the, 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 the hardness of computing the permanent on a random matrix. That's average case hardness. Okay? Uh, and the, the, the property we're going to use to, to boost the hardness to average case hardness is, is what we call, uh, sorry, it's very simple. It's, it's that the permanent is a degree n polynomial in n squared variables. And that's easy to see from the expression. The n squared variables are the matrix entries, the n by n matrix entries. Um, okay, so what's the setting? So this, this, this is the setting of, of, of uh, Lipton's proof. We want to compute, the, go, the goal is to compute the permanent of a worst case matrix, an arbitrary matrix, let's say with entries over some sufficiently large finite field, FP. Uh, we know that's a hard problem. That's, that's Valiant's result, okay? But we, 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 we don't have that ability. We only have access to a sort of faulty algorithm O, okay, that works to correctly compute most permanents. Right? The permanent of most matrices over the finite field. In other words, this is what O does. We give it as input a randomly chosen matrix, and then it outputs something, which most of the time, you know, on a good day, is, you know, agrees with the permanent. But on a bad day, say a 1 over poly fraction of the, of the uh, ma matrices, it outputs complete nonsense. And from my perspective, the end user of this box, this, this al faulty algorithm O, I don't know which is which. All right? and so, what, what Lipton shows is, is, is really brilliant. Uh, I think it's, it's a very simple way of computing the, the permanent of our worst case matrix, whatever matrix you want, an arbitrary matrix, using this, this faulty algorithm. Okay, that we, we don't know when it works and when it doesn't. We just know it works most of the time. Okay, and it's a very simple polynomial extrapolation argument. The idea is as follows. We choose n plus 1 fixed non-zero points in our field. Let's call them t1, t2, through tn plus 1. Uh, and a uniformly random matrix R. And now we consider the line A of T, which is X plus T times R. So that's our, our worst case matrix X that we want to know the permanent of, but we don't, uh, plus some random shift. OK, that's, that's the line. Now, it's two observations. And once we, once we tell you the observations, the proof essentially is straightforward. And they're very simple. So first, I call the scrambling property, which is that for each I individually, A of T sub I is a uniformly random matrix over the finite field. That's not hard to see. We took a fixed matrix. We shifted it by something random. All right, well, the new matrix is random. Okay? In fact, each one of these points, A of T1, A of T2, and so on, these are all uniformly random matrix. Now, they're correlated with each other, but individually, they're uniformly random. All right. The second observation is what we call the univariate polynomial property, which is that the permanent of A of T is a degree n polynomial, but now in a single variable T. Uh, and, and that's, of course, inherited from the algebraic property of the permanent itself, that the permanent itself is a, is a polynomial. OK, but now it sort of says what we should do. This is a polynomial extrapolation problem. You know, we have uh, these, these n plus 1 uh, matrices, right? Uh, these, these points that determine these matrices. Uh, they all individually look random. So we can use our, 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 our faulty algorithm, O, to compute the permanent of a, you know, of a of t1, permanent of a of t2, and so on, up through per, permanent of a of tn n plus 1. 
Right? Well, once we, once we have those n plus 1 points, well, those uniquely determine this polynomial because the polynomial, which is permanent of a of t, because that's a degree n polynomial now specified at n plus 1 points. Right? So then we can use polynomial extrapolation to reconstruct the coefficients of that polynomial. Once we do that, once we have the permanent of a of t in our hands, it's trivial to get back the permanent of x, our worst case matrix, by evaluating t at 0. Because when t is equal to 0, a of t is equal to x by construction. Right? Now, the reason this works, to be clear, is because despite the fact that this, this, this box is, is, is faulty, is that if, if, if the success probability of O is sufficiently high, like 1 minus 1 over, let's say, 3 times n, we can ensure by a union bound that that box is correct on all n plus 1 points. Okay? And then, indeed, everything works. No, that doesn't, it's a great question. That's the whole point. It doesn't matter. We're union bounding that away. Right. Great. Uh, OK, now, how do we adapt this argument from the, from the permanent of a random matrix to the output probability of a random circuit? This was really the goal in our 2018 paper. And what we notice here is that actually, from a mathematical point of view, the permanent and the output probability of a random circuit have some similar properties. Uh, in particular, uh, much like the permanent, the output probability of a random quantum circuit has polynomial structure. Now, how, how do I see that? Let's say we take our worst case circuit. This is the circuit we want to know the output probability of. And we pull it apart into its two qubit gates. So it's CM times CM minus 1. These are two qubit gates. Now, the polynomial structure comes from the path integral, right? which allows us to write the output amplitude of the circuit uh, as this gigantic sum. It's a sum of an exponential number of paths. right? But the point is, the value of each path, you know, the value of each term, is, 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 is manageable. Right? It's just the product of m gate entries. And all we're doing here, of course, is resolving the identity. Um, right? and so this is a polynomial of degree m, where m is the size of the circuit, in the gate entries of the circuit. Okay? And so the, the, the output probability by the Born rule is just a, a, a polynomial of degree 2m, or just squaring. OK, so now, how do we sort of use this polynomial structure to replicate Lipton's proof? OK, so in particular, how do we scramble the worst case circuit C? That was the whole idea of Lipton's proof, that we had a particular circuit that we wanted to know the output probability of. It's completely arbitrary. And we wanted to sort of scramble it to make it look more random. OK, so here, here's, here's a first attempt. It's not going to quite work, but it will fail instructively. Uh, we're going to fix uh, m har random gates, a two qubit gates. So we'll call them h1, h2, through hm, where m, remember, is the number of gates in the worst case circuit. Uh, now, the main idea is to scramble the worst case circuit C, but doing so in a way that preserves a little bit of structure. Okay? And, and we're going to gain that structure by implementing a tiny fraction of the inverse of these, two, of these, of these, of these gates, <coughs> these har random gates HI. So here's how we scramble. Each ith gate in the scrambled circuit, which I'm calling C prime, is going to be equal to the ith gate of the worst case circuit, that's CI times hi. Now, now, at this point, we've completely scrambled the circuit. It's har random by the invariance property, the har measure. Right? OK, but we're not going to be done. We're going to multiply by e to the minus i little hi, which is the log of big hi, times theta, some parameter, okay? some, some number. OK, now, here's what, here, we're, 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 what we observe is that this is very Lipton-like in the following sense. If we take theta to be really, really tiny, right? then in fact, you know, this e to the minus i little h i theta does almost nothing. So we're still essentially har random. It's very similar to just ci times hi. But if, if, if we don't take theta be tiny, if it's really big, if it's 1, right? well, then we've actually completely undone these har random gates, so we get back our worst case circuit. It's very similar to the Lipton idea. OK, so then what's the strategy? Well, the idea is very similar. We then take several non-zero but small thetas, theta 1, theta 2, and so on. For each one, we have a random but correlated circuit, c prime of theta 1, c prime of theta 2, and so on. Uh, then we, 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 we use our, our faulty algorithm to compute the output probabilities of each one of these random but correlated circuits, and we extrapolate. Right? And once we extrapolate, once we have this single variate polynomial in theta, we can then you know, uh, access the output probability of our worst case circuit, C, by evaluating at theta equal 1. That's the idea. It's not quite right, and for, uh, for, for a sort of very simple reason, which is that e to the minus i h i theta is just not a fixed degree polynomial in theta. 
Okay? So our first, uh, our first paper fixes this in the way any good physicist would, fi would, would fix this, which is to take a fixed degree Taylor series truncation of a e to the minus i h i theta. So in other words, here's the final way we scramble. We, we make each gate in the new scrambled circuit c prime sub theta. It's c i times h i times the kth order Taylor series truncation of e to the minus uh, i, uh, a, sorry, e to the minus i h i theta. Uh, so now each gate entry is a polynomial in theta because the Taylor series is a polynomial in theta. And then by the path integral, so is the output probability. Okay. We can now extrapolate. We can evaluate the extrapolated polynomial one, and we're in business, except for some subtleties. Okay, which turn out turn out to be like the root of the technical work in this paper. And the first subtlety is, is sort of very obvious, I think. So the truncations are now going to make the distribution we're considering supported on slightly non-unitary circuits. Right? That's sort of not good. Um, I, I, I'm going to sort of wave my hands through this, but this is a very technical result. Uh, in, our, in, our, in our paper, we address this by proving that you know, if we, if we, what we really consider is, is estimation, which is really the goal at the end of the day, not to compute the output probability exactly, but to compute an estimation. Well, if we consider estimation, then in fact, these truncations don't matter. And we prove this formally. We say that you know, um, proving that estimating the output, the, the, the output probability of the truncated random circuit is exactly as hard as estimating the output probability of the unitary truncated circuit, essentially because uh, you know, the, the error that you're incurring when you're truncating the Taylor series is so much smaller than the error that you're conjecturing is hard. Um, OK, the other thing that I think is actually much more important and that we're still sort of grappling with to this today, um, today is that so far we've assumed the ability to compute the output probabilities of the random circuits, these random but correlated circuits, exactly. And you know, recall that what we really wanted was not exact computation of these, these random uh, circuit output probabilities, but a 2 to the minus n uh, uh, additive error. We wanted to show that that was hard, which is a much stronger statement. And we still can't do this. We've been working on this for a long time. The state of the art result is that we can show that these, these, um, these arguments are robust to error 2 to the minus m log m, where m is the size of the circuit. So it's like n times d. All right, so this is uh, not where we want to be. But what I'll say is actually for boson sampling, that's this linear optical experiment I haven't described, uh, we, can, we, can, we can get better. So uh, it's actually sort of infuriatingly better in the sense that you know, what we want changes, the, because this is 1 over the Hilbert space dimension, which for boson sampling is 1 over e to the n log n. Uh, and what we have a hardness at is 1 over e to the 6 n log n. So we're off by a, f a factor of 6 in the exponent. Uh, and uh, it, it's not at all clear uh, how to improve it from there. We're, you know, we're currently working on it. It's really infuriating. Uh, OK. Um, so now, OK, but now, so far, I haven't talked about noise. And this is an elephant in the room, because we know that the NISC era is defined by noise. Right? And so you know, does this quantum signal survive uncorrected noise? Uh, you know, Google's experiment, for example, I don't think I even need to tell you guys, you know, it claimed 0.2% um, signal, 99.8% uh, uh, noise, every indication that if they had not reduced their noise and made their system larger, this would exponentially decay. Um, and, but but it's, it's very subtle to understand how to theoretically model this in, this in the correct way. So the first way we're going to do it is sort of not so subtle. We're just going to say, let's talk about depolarizing noise, single qubit depolarizing noise. All right, so uh, let's say each, each layer of har random two qubit random gates is, is followed by this, this, this single qubit uh, depolarizing mo uh, model, where the noise strength is a positive constant. That's very important for everything I'm about to say, in fact. It's constant, OK? It doesn't depend on system size. Right. So this is a very popular model, uh, but it's not quite right. right? We know it's oversimplified. There's much more there. Okay? Um, but intuitively, what's going on with depolarizing noise in particular is that it has a very simple effect to understand on, on, on quantum circuits. You know, it's, I think of it as just sort of increasing entropy. So every time you sort of do this and you're not, you, you have a, a layer of gates and then you know, depolarizing noise and a layer of gates and then depolarizing it, you keep increasing your entropy. And because we don't measure, we don't add ancillas or whatever, there's no escaping this. We're going to eventually converge to the uniform distribution. Right? 
So the first question we should ask is, how close is the output distribution of a noisy random quantum circuit with depolarizing noise only and the uniform distribution? Actually, we know the answer to this now. Uh, it's, it's, it's 2 to the minus O of D. Okay? It's actually both a lower bound and an upper bound, an upper bound that was proven by really foundational result, uh, work of Dorit and a lower bound that my group proved recently for random quantum circuits. Okay? So the answer is 2 to the minus O of D. The O is hiding some constants. Uh, and so in some sense, this rules out scalable noisy quantum advantage at super logarithmic depth. Because if you're super logarithmic, 2 to the d, you know, if d is super logarithmic, then 2 to the d is, 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 is you know, smaller than any, uh, 2 to the minus d is smaller than any polynomial. All right. But then you should ask, well, OK, wait, wait a second. What about shallow depth circuits? Right? So you know, if the depth is at most log, then the distribution is inverse poly far from uniform. It's also inverse poly close to uniform. But it's, it's, in particular, it's inverse poly far from uniform. Uh, even here, right, a recent paper of uh, Doreen collaborators um, that's a very beautiful result gave a classical algorithm for sampling from the output distribution of noisy, uh, uh, no, no, noisy log depth random quantum circuits with depolarizing noise. OK, what is the idea? Uh, well, the idea is the following. It's, it's really beautiful. It's re we really love this paper. The idea is to, to write the noisy output probability as a path integral on the poly basis. So we won't get into this too much detail, but you know, it's very similar to the path integral you just saw on the computational basis. Uh, but in the sense that now we're writing this, the, this output probability, this noisy output probability, p twiddle of x, as a giant sum. You know, it's a giant sum of uh, over an exponential number of paths. Each path is indexed by you know, a d plus 1 tuple of n, n qubit poly operators. Uh, uh, but, but the nice thing about this is that each term in the sum individually is manageable. Right? It has sort of two components. There's a noise component, 1 minus gamma, that's the noise rate, to the, what, we, what we'll call the weight of the path. Uh, that's the bar s notation, times, times some function that's, you know, efficiently computable. Okay? That's this f of c s x. Okay? And the key point of that is that you know, even though if we wanted to compute this quantity naively just by computing every single path, which you know, in principle we could do if we had enough time, that would, that would be a crazy way to do this because, if we're, because we can get a pretty good approximation you know, by simply you know, only caring about some of these paths. And the reason for that is because, a very small number, in fact, and the reason for that is because these output probabilities of the noisy circuit in the poly basis are exponentially suppressed in the weight of the path right, because of this noise contribution, right? We don't have to care about all the terms if we want a good estimation. We just have to care about terms that, you know, have a uh, small number of non-identity operators, okay? A uh, small weight of the path. OK, and so that's exactly how their classical algorithm works. It takes this noisy output probability, it computes it by throwing away paths with sufficiently high poly weight. OK, but the analysis of this algorithm uses anti-concentration. Anti-concentration could be like a talk in and of itself, just talking about these subtleties of anti-concentration. What I want to say is that anti-concentration is how they bound their approximation error, and it, it, it's critical in, in their algorithm. Uh, and roughly speaking, it, it means that the output distribution of the random circuit is sort of well spread over outcomes, exactly what you would think from the title. It kind of means, you know, roughly speaking, that there's not, uh, you know, that it, it's not like the, the, a lot of the, uh, the mass of the distribution is supported on some very small, you know, fraction of, 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 of uh, outcomes, okay? So it's, it's kind of uniform-like. Not necessarily the uniform distribution, but uniform-like, well spread. Uh, and we know that anti-concentration is a property of sufficiently deep random circuits. Um, so for noiseless circuits or for, for circuits with depolarizing noise, we know that, that anti-concentration starts at log depth. Before log depth, it, does, it, it's, it badly fails. Uh, it's a result we have in 2022. Uh, and it's also, it, it suffices. So at log depth, you get anti-concentration. Okay? And that, this is, by the way, why you know, in Dorit's paper, they're requiring log depth. Their algorithm does not work, or it's not known to work for shallower depth, precisely because we don't have anti-concentration at shallower depth. Okay? Um, so here, here's sort of how I'm going, to, I'm going to end. We've been obsessed with this paper recently. This is a beautiful paper. I think it tells us a lot about uh, noise and random circuits. Uh, and we've been try we like it so much, we've been trying to adapt it to other noise models. And we've been having mixed success. Okay? So sort of good news and bad news, and which one is which depends entirely on your perspective. Uh, but the, the, the good news is that for, for boson sampling, uh, with a Gaussian noise model, um, 
which I can explain, but it's not that important. We, we show that a similar classical algorithm works, a very a highly reminiscent uh, algorithm from, from Dorit that sort of expresses the noisy output probabilities as some sort of some sum, some series, and then sort of truncates and so on. OK. But what I want to say about Gaussian, so Gaussian noise just means that we take the linear optical unitary u, and then you sort of, it, 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 it gets sent to square root gamma times u time plus 1 minus gamma times a Gaussian matrix. Okay? This is not a physical noise model. This is, uh, this is something that Gil Kalai had studied uh, when he was trying to, I think, destroy boson sampling uh, at an earlier date. Uh, but but the, from, our per, from, from, from our perspective, uh, it's an interesting noise model because it increases entropy. It, it, in in some sense, it's, it's, it's kind of the, uh, in, in some analog, it's, it's very similar to the depolarizing noise uh, in, in, in random circuits. Uh, and you know, so we weren't entirely surprised that then this algorithm should work for that noise model. Right? It's also, it's increasing entropy in the sense that if you keep applying it, you clearly get to the maximally mixed state or the uniform <laughs> distribution. So what's frustrating us, though, is we were not able to make this algorithm work when you consider noisy boson sampling with actually the, the, the noise model that really uh, sort of dominates in most, in most, uh, uh, you know, in most uh, reasonable experiments, which is photon loss. We're very interested in this for two reasons. One, because it was the right, it's sort of the right model to study in, in boson sampling if you want like one noise, uh, noise model. Two, because it, it, it seemed to have a very different quantitative property than depolarizing noise, right? Photon, no photon loss you know, sort of decreases entropy. It's compared with increases entropy. So we wanted to know if there was any sh we had any chance at making a similar algorithm work uh, in that case. And we were not able to do that. We're still not able to do it. We're still, we're still working on it. But one thing we, uh, we think we can prove recently is super recent work, so recent it's not even published. Uh, um, but what, what we, can, we, we can say is actually in, for, for, for random circuits, so back to Google's experiment, you know, we know that depolarizing noise is not the only noise source, right? It's, 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 a, it's a good noise source, it's an important noise source, it may be the dominant noise source, but it's not the only one that we see. Uh, and so we're particularly interested in the following question, which is what happens if you add depolarizing noise at each layer together with amplitude damping or some non-unital noise? Right? Uh, this is actually a, you know, a reasonable, still oversimplified uh, you know, um, uh, picture of what happens in an experiment. You know, T1 noise is, is amplitude damping. Uh, you know, but the point is amplitude damping, essentially, you know, r roughly speaking, and the theorist talking about it, it takes, it takes a 1 and sort of sends it to a 0. That's essentially what amplitude damping does. It loses entropy. Uh, it's non-unital. <coughs> OK. Uh, now, what we can show is that anti-concentration fails here. Okay, and it, and it fails for any depth, so it fails very badly. Okay, uh, and and this is sort of surprising to us in the sense that you know I think we wouldn't have been so surprised if we were just talking about the the the, the amplitude damping channel and no and no uh, depolarizing noise. But what's interesting here is that there's clearly sort of a fight going on. That's how I think about it. It's like the depolarizing noise is like increasing your entropy. It's like spreading you out, right? But then the 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 amplitude damping, it's sort of like you know. Uh, it's kind of concentrating things. So it's kind of, a, uh, kind of a fight. And it seems to us, at least, naively, as though uh, amplitude damping is kind of winning this fight in some, in some ways. On the other hand, the upsetting thing is I love to tell you now we get hardness and everyone should be happy. It's not at all what I feel. In fact, uh, what I'll tell you is that you know, the, hardness ten uses, the hardness arguments for, for random circuit sampling, they use anti-concentration as well. So the only thing I can really tell you is that we're now completely clueless as what to do with these, with these circuits uh, you know, for which we know neither hardness nor easiness. It's a really great open question. Uh, in fact, that's where I'm going to end. I'll, I'll mention a few open questions, and then I'll take some questions of, of, of yours. So first, uh, the obvious one, right? We didn't quite finish that noiseless, uh, that noiseless question. Um, you know, can we prove the hardness of sampling from random circuits in the noiseless case? Uh, we, we've gotten really close in some cases, but we still need to show that 2 to the minus n uh, precision is hard, and we don't have that. Okay? For boson sampling, we're a constant factor away, but we don't have it. OK, uh, how hard are, are random quantum circuits with low noise? So, so you know, in, in the last few weeks, Google had a new experiment. And a lot of what they, what, what, what they were doing there was they were saying that a lot of their benchmarking, their, their cross-entropy benchmarking, uh, it sort of makes sense 
as long as your noise rate is a lot smaller than we were talking about, right, is, is something like one over the system size, or in fact, some constant over the system size. And in fact, if you're interested in these questions, which is what they were interested in, sort of where does cross entropy correspond with fidelity? Uh, you know, they, they think they can identify a sharp transition in the, in, in the noise rate, where at a certain constant over n, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's there, cross entropy is a good signal for, is a good match for fidelity, but then if you get larger noise rate, you get more noise, it, it stops becoming that. And that was a major part of their recent 70 qubit uh, D equal 24 experiment. Uh, and so it would be interesting to understand better the complexity of this regime, even though fundamentally as n scales, this is not such a reasonable model, I think, of, uh, of noise, just because it, it means that your noise is getting better as, as, as your system size increases, which is a little, a little bit strange. OK, uh, and, and then finally, of course, can we find better RCS verification protocols? I didn't even touch this, a touch on this in this talk, something that you know, is an extremely important topic. I could talk uh, on and on for I won't bore you anymore. Let's stop there and take your questions. <laughs>